Hey everybody, this is Lucky Episode 13 and Part 2 of our four-part series for new gun owners. In this episode, we cover the types of firearms training that is available out there and how to vet the instructors that are putting those courses on. So stick around. that are designed to make you a more informed and effective gunfighter. If it has to do with alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and everything else, we're going to talk about it. Guys, gals, and submarine racers, here are your hosts, Jay Eisenicki and Mike Garza. All right, everybody, welcome to Lucky Episode 13. I don't know if maybe we should have just skipped. I don't know, skip from twelve to fourteen. Uh, I'm not really sure. Wait till Halloween. Oh, that would have been a great idea, man. I should have thought of that. But you know, either way, it's it's lucky thirteen. That's our episode today. Thanks for joining us. If you got any questions, podcast at ladenforce.com. Anyways, yeah, you know. Questions, comments, throw them in the comment section of this podcast or uh, throw them in the comment section when we post it up on Facebook. So, Mike, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. I'm at level four of the drunken scale. Really? Yeah. Really? Look at you go. It's strange because... Although you cannot see me, or you can see me, but I can't see you, is that I am also, well, I wouldn't say I'm at a level of four. I just got started. Um, Chestnut Farms, Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey today, bottled in bond. It's got a little bit of bite to it, but it's really, really yummy. So (laughs) I'm liking that. So, But you're doing good, huh? Yeah, pretty soon I'll get my little, uh, I have my new office now. It's all air conditioned, and soon enough I'll get my uh, blower fan in here. I'll be able to vent my cigar smoke out. So ah, very I shall good. smoke in 73 degree weather, even though outside in sunny Arizona, it's 113. That's a great idea. <laughs> I, I need to create something like that because I have to do that outside. And, you know, we talked about this and I think we have failed. We did cover the bourbon conversation a few podcasts ago, but we haven't uh, we haven't got onto the cigars. I think it's I think we're going to have to do that here pretty soon. I agree. Yeah. It'd be better if we could be in the same room so we can be smoking cigars at the same time. Well, if do you have a room that's 73 degrees? Mm, no. <laughs> so I guess we know where we'll, we'll be doing it next time. <laughs> Vacation time. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, hey, um, you know, I, I always like to share a wonderful story. Not every single one of them has to do with personal defense and the Second Amendment and all that kind of stuff. But I do like to share stories that I think are are educational and, um, you know, maybe sometimes they're even entertaining. But I learned about a guy just the other day uh, in Georgia. And uh, he received, if you haven't heard this story yet, uh, he received his final paycheck in pennies. Wow. 91,515 pennies is what his employer delivered to his driveway for his final paycheck. Can you say somebody is pissed off? I, That's a, I, I didn't even realize banks still carried pennies that much, that many anyways. That many. Yeah. So this guy is, <laughs> here's what's even better. I mean, usually it's like, you know, somebody goes in and they take it to the, you know, to the county government and they, or the city or the state and they pay their bill in pennies. But this one apparently uh, was a little bit different story. <clears throat> so the guy's name in, it lives in Georgia and his name is, uh, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. The, the, the pile was the work of a guy named Miles Walker, who is owner of AOK Walker 
Auto Works, a body shop in Peachtree City, Georgia. So hopefully, hopefully he's not a, a listener, but you never know. <laughs> so uh, the guy um, in here was named. His last name's Flatten, like you flatten a pancake or something like that. That was the guy's name. I can't remember what his first name was. Uh, oh, Andreas Flatten of Fayetteville, Georgia. Um, he originally found a pile of 91,515 pennies on his driveway in March with a note attached to them that read, and, and hold your ears, all you sensitive people, the note said, F- you. And that was from his employer, who was Miles Walker from the AOK Walker Automotive uh, Body Shop in Peachtree City, Georgia. So apparently Walker uh, had reportedly denied Flatten his last paycheck and only acquiesced after Flatten had contacted the Georgia Department of Labor. Can you imagine what it would be, what you'd have to do with 91,000 coins? So. Not only was, uh, <laughs> this, is what, this is what gets really funny, uh, is that this is according to Flatten. Uh, it was a shock and frustrating to be paid in this manner. And it was an extra burden that the pennies were covered with an oily substance. <laughs> so not only did he get a pile of them, he got them all covered in, in oil of some kind. And he was spending one hour to two hours every night trying to clean the pennies and probably only cleaned off about $5 worth every night. So that is fantastic. Talk about somebody getting even. So now ultimately what ended up happening is this, uh, company Coinstar. I don't know if you ever heard of them before. Yeah. They're, um, in the, they're in the food grocery store up front usually. Okay. So the CEO of Coinstar caught on to this story and he felt bad about them. And they, they process apparently 41 million coins annually. So they decided that taking his 91,000 coins was no big deal. So they helped him out and took his coin. But I, I found what was, what was interesting. I don't know. I'm not, and I'm not bagging on anybody that's in Georgia, but it's, it's kind of funny is so apparently flattens girlfriend here. I am saying apparently again, but it's because it's written in the article. So cut me some slack. Uh, flattens girlfriend, Olivia Oxley, who had previously posted footage of the oil soy soaked coins on social media and called Walker an asshole who made unnecessary comments about my boyfriend, daughter, boyfriend's daughter, and was just an all around dick celebrated the coin conversion on Instagram and shared the story to the local CBS affiliate. So I just thought that was interesting. And, uh, so, you know, they guy gets, you know, 600 pounds of pennies because he, you know, complained because he didn't get his last paycheck. So, so not that I have ever done this at all, but when we did our senior prank at our high school, we got blamed, even though there was no evidence, we got blamed and it was called a senior prank. We had, uh, we had caused a little bit of damage by breaking a key off into the door and going upstairs and turning off all the air conditioners. Uh, the mantle throw switch on the top. <clears throat> so they had to hire an electrician to figure out what we did. We'd also pulled all the hot wires off the light switches in all the rooms. So anyways, nice. needless to say, we caused, I don't know, $350, I think was the total bill. So that's exactly what we did. We we paid them, <laughs> the student the student body, the senior student body, paid the this, this school with pennies. And now we didn't oil them. That's a very extra awesome touch. See, yeah. <laughs> but we did get two football players to pick up the five gallon bucket of pennies and dump them into another five gallon bucket of pennies so that everyone could see that we paid them in pennies. Unfortunately, that backfired because for detention, <laughs> everybody had to roll pennies <laughs> because the bank wouldn't take <laughs> them because there was no coin star back in the day. <laughs> That's too funny. That is too funny. So you, you screwed over somebody else down the line that had That's to, a, they needed yeah, it. yeah, there you go. Lessons well, learned. well, the, the one thing that we can take from this is that coin star was willing to step up and process all of his coins so he could get his thousand bucks. But, uh, if so, everybody knows is that, uh, AOK Walker auto body or auto works has received a flood of, of negative Yelp and Google reviews. <laughs> of so course. justice has been served in the great 
the great Penny episode there in Peachtree City, Georgia. So, <laughs> you know, I had what you know, strange things that happen out there. Now, if you remember, um, we talked not too long ago about a new show that came out, and it was called. It had Steve Carell in it, and it was called uh, Space Force. Do you remember that? I do remember. How's that show doing, by the way? I watched the whole first season. Um, I don't know if it's been renewed. <laughs> I'm going to venture a guess and say probably not. But I did I did make it through the whole series. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to. Um, but I know we got into kind of a conversation. We talked about the dragon capsule. And 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 I know somewhere in there you, you said we were going to get in trouble with Tide because um, you told everybody to go eat Tide Pods. Um, <laughs> and then we talked about, you know, the people out in, out in space and their space onesies for Space Force. So I came across something that put both of these fantastic things that we talked about not too long ago together. And it, and it raised a question for me. And I'm going to ask and see what you, if you know, or if anybody else knows. When they're in space, what do they do with their laundry? Uh, this was a question just the other day in the news, I think, or at least uh, on the show that I watched. They, yeah, they were talking about it, and they're like, "How do you wash your clothes? You can't. You got to just wear it, same one over and over again." Right. So th- there is a problem that needs to be solved, and apparently, Tide was ready to step up and solve the problem. <laughs> so currently, so I you got to go out and do some research, right? So currently astronauts, um, they just wear their underwear, their gym clothes and everything else until they can't take the filth and the stink anymore. And then they just throw them away. So here's the problem, um, is that NASA wants to change that, which is good, good for NASA, right? I mean, they're, they're trying to solve problems. Wait, are you saying there's dirty underwear floating around in space? Well, that just might be well. I don't think it's true. I think what happens is, is they jettison this stuff as they're uh, re-entering the atmosphere and it burns up. So well, that's even flam- worse. Now there's doo doo falling from the sky. Well, they're not they're not pooping in their in their space shorts. Well, listen. Every now and then, when I fart, I leave a little oh, trace. Too much. So you know, <laughs> so then I have to wash it right away. So if they, if I do that, it's not like astronauts are special and perfect. I mean, come on. They're they're jettisoning doo doo underwear into the atmosphere and it's falling down on us. I'm 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 going to call NASA and cancel them. Oh my God! <laughs> I cannot believe you just shared that information. Okay, <clears throat> all right. Well, now we know. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you sharing that. Okay. I'm glad everybody. Please don't wreck your car as you're laughing down the road. So apparent. It turns out. God, I got to stop saying apparently. <laughs> um. So on their way either to the moon or to Mars, they've got to stop throwing away tons of dirty clothes every year. They stuff them into the trash to burn them up in the atmosphere aboard discarded cargo ships. So that's how they're getting rid of uh, getting rid of the stuff now. So anything that's discarded to burn up in the atmosphere is has bags or canisters or whatever of their discarded clothes. So they're teaming up with Procter and Gamble, which who makes Tide and Tide Pods, the ones that all the kids nowadays, the whole rage is to eat them. <laughs> um, so they're trying to figure out how to best clean their, their, their space onesies out there. So um, I thought that was interesting. I, I never really thought about how they do that to clean their clothes up there and whether they did. I just assumed that they had a you know space washing machine. Turns why out they can't don't. Uh, why can't they just get some Febreze and just spray them down every now and then? Well, that's true. Now, here's a little thing that you wouldn't even know about it is that they've got to take clothes. You know, everything that every pound has a cost to get up into space. And however, I don't know, I don't know what it what it costs, but yeah, well, it's per fuel, right? Too. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's freaking expensive. I'm sure. I mean, it, it you put whatever on there, it costs a million dollars probably to get it into space. So. Um, an astronaut needs on average 150 pounds of clothes in space per year. So you got, you know, six or eight, you know, astronauts up there. You got like a thousand pounds, half a ton. So it could get pretty expensive throwing clothes up into space. So now they're trying to figure out how to make special fabric and then how to wash that stuff so they can get it all clean. So I don't know. It's pretty interesting. That kind of makes you wonder about all these movies. 
how did they wash clothes when they were out in space? Exactly. I don't. This, these are the questions to be answered. Can you go needs, commando in your spacesuit? Would that be okay? Um, I mean, I, you would think that it would make more sense to just go commando all the time. I mean, it should be it sh- it should be like a naked beach up on the space station. <laughs> I mean, seriously, then they wouldn't, have, I think that's the solution. This is Somebody, a kind of nonsense I'm going to dream about tonight because oh, of you. You're going to, so what, you're going to dream about naked astronauts now? Well, no, me that's being a mess. an astronaut up there naked. Okay. Well, I, that's what happens when I have chestnut farms, <laughs> straight Kentucky bourbon, as we start thinking about that. I, I, I'd like to call NASA and just tell them is that they just need to stop wearing clothes. And that would probably solve the problem. So, anyways, there we go. Anywho, so um, you know, we like to talk about things that have to do with, uh, you know, with with the Second Amendment. And so, recently, here this month, um, there was some good news that came out of the state of Kami, I mean California, <laughs> uh, and that was a um, a judge overturn California's 32-year-old ban on assault weapons. Yay! Welcome to the 21st century. They banned assault weapons. <laughs> Calm oh, down. Sorry, Calm I'm, down. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to institutionalize you. Yeah, I'm talking like the president again, <laughs> whispering. So, yeah, this is what ended up happening. A federal judge overturned California's three-decade-old ban on assault weapons, calling it a failed experiment that violates people's constitutional rights to bear arms. That was U.S. District Judge Roger Benitez of San Diego, and he ruled on that uh, state's definition of illegal military-style rifles unlawfully deprives law-abiding Californians of weapons commonly used for self-protection. Uh, so thought it was pretty interesting that they did that. Now, the, the problem with all of this is, is that shortly after is, as you know, um, or maybe you don't know, is that even though all that stuff was overturned and everybody got very excited um, I, I could kind of read what was going to happen here. I mean, it's California. You think they're just going to go away quietly into the night? Not no. a chance. Not a chance. So an appeals court um, shortly after, only two weeks later, um, so the Californians were all very excited for about two weeks, um, an appeals court for guess where? What circuit court? You, you, you're right. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. <laughs> Imagine that. No surprise there. Uh, they overturned uh, that judge's ruling. I, I thought this was interesting. I seen a bunch of the the um, the mimes that or the memes. Excuse me. Um, mimes. Mimes. <laughs> you're getting hate mail for that one. <laughs> there's there's nothing wrong with mimes. <laughs> So the memes that are out there about uh, the assault weapons are like a Swiss army knife because uh, um, apparently, oh my gosh, that's just annoying now. Now I got to figure out how to, I need to get like a taser just, attached to me. That just you, get a thesaurus. Uh, is, that, is that some sort of a dinosaur? No, I just give you my Mexican one. It does all kinds of cool transition words and everything. Okay, okay. In, uh, <laughs> a thoris, a thorosaurus rex. Okay. So, 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 I can't. I yeah, can't yeah, say it. yeah, yeah. So, anyways, uh, the one-page order, uh, comprised of a three-judge panel, issued a stay um, from the district judge uh, Roger Benitez, who we talked about, um, in which he ruled that the section of the state's ban is placed since 1989. Um, regarding military styles of rifles is un- unconstitutional. So these guys then came in and said, well, um, they shall now, the appeals court said, they shall remain in effect until further order of this court. So we imagine that what is going to end up happening is that this is going to be um, a long, drawn-out sure, fight for sure. Litigation. Well, what's funny is I was reading here the excerpt. I just pulled it up real quick on the interwebs. That uh, Who's that guy that invented it? He was running. He was vice president. Who invented the internet? <laughs> Is this oh, Al Gore. Al Gore. Al Gore. That's it. Yeah. Since Al Gore's internet here, and uh, yeah, it's funny. It says that the AR-15 is a kind of versatile gun that lies in the intersection of the kinds of firearms protected under DC and Heller, 
And then uh, it goes on to say, historically, traditional prohibiting the carrying dangerous and unusual weapons, weapons that are most useful in military service, M16 rifles and the like. Uh, just for the record, boys and girls, the AR-15 has never been used in a war. Just for the record. The- Idiots. It's, yeah, I know. It just looks like it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there it's very scary and that's that's all the uh, what I thought was and this is where it was interesting is that the um Benita has actually said in in his uh 90 fa- 94 page ruling it said like the Swiss army knife, the popular AR15 rifle is a perfect combination of home defense weapon right. and homeland defense equipment. So, that was where that whole thing started with all the memes with uh, you know, with all the making it look like a Swiss army knife. So, yeah. Um but yeah, that's that's a, an awesome point is that the AR15 hasn't even been in war. I mean, hello. Well, we went to war with uh, Iran, right? According to the president. Did we? Oh, yeah. That's what he said. We went to war with Iran. <laughs> so it's all kinds of fake news coming out now. <laughs> <laughs> we need to ban the AR-15. <laughs> Let me whisper some more. Which, of course, to all our viewers, our listeners, I, was gonna, I guess not viewers, all our listeners, right? AR stands for assault rifle. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, oh my I, gosh. I've waited the dramatic pause uh, to see how many people's heads exploded. That's, that's, no, it doesn't. It stands for Armalite. <laughs> well, that was good. You know, the, hey, we the whole thing is we're trying to educate new gun owners. And so for all those new gun owners that are joining us for part two of our series um, directly relating to uh, new gun owners is that AR-15 does not stand for assault rifle number 15. It's not, <laughs> it, it's not like a uh, Chanel Mama number, number five. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it is the Armalite rifle is what, uh, is where that comes from. So um, yeah, I, I thought that was interesting is that that's where it goes. And so obviously for uh, the future is that, it's kind of wondering is what does that mean for the rest of America with these assault weapons and them being able to kind of actually get some, get some traction maybe, or maybe get a toehold here on the battle against these assault weapon bans in California, especially. So it looks like that'll have an impact kind of on um, America going forward. If, if, you know, if I'm reading it right. Well, and the funny thing is, is, I mean, in California, you can have an AR, right, but it's got to look, all weird. You have to have a magazine that cannot be easily detached and yeah, the stock can't be collapsible. I mean, it's essentially the same uh, long gun. So I, I don't, I don't understand like what, who cares? I, I, I never understood the political battle that these idiots wage. And not only that, they really do look stupid because they don't know what they're talking about. Reminds me of that lady from the Denver where she's like, I don't understand why everyone's raging about high capacity mags when they're all used up. They're, they get thrown away anyways. I'm like, wow, there's yeah. someone that understands absolutely nothing. And these people are making all the laws and everything in the land. So, yeah, I, I remember us talking about that one a few podcasts back. So, I mean, really, ultimately, we're, we're looking at how this impacts everybody. So, well, what does this matter to everyone else? Is that if this gets appealed to the Supreme Court, which it likely will, is that we have a far more conservative Supreme Court now than we have in a long time. And that was obviously the fight when, uh, when Trump appointed Kavanaugh and why they just, you know, Tried to well, and just Amy, burn that guy down. And also, yeah, and and uh, the the new justice as well. Yeah, exactly. So that it should be um, it should be interesting to see how that happens because that could potentially have some good out, outcome for. I know they're fighting a lot of battles that are up in um, you know in the um, in the Northeast in other states there like uh, Maryland, Massachusetts, those type of areas where they're really struggling with a lot of those bands that are out there for sure. So. Um, anyways, I just thought I'd bring that up and see if there was anything that, uh, you thought specifically about that, that was important to mention. Yeah, no. I, and Amy Cohn, Amy, oh my gosh, I cannot say her name. Amy Cohn, Coney Barrett is the new, the new one. Yeah. So, uh, that's right. That's right. That's yes. who I was thinking of. Okay. I, I apologize for butchering her name. Yeah. So it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that for sure. Yeah. Well, I guess we have to move on. Uh, let me take another slug here. <laughs> what your whistle? Yes. Before we get started. Um, so 
the whole point of today's was to be part two in our new gun owner um, discussion um, about gun ownership. And as we talked in the previous podcast is that in 2020, 5 million new gun owners um, are out there and 45% of the gun owners are first time, are first time gun owners, I guess, purchasers. That's what the retails is saying. Um, so we felt it was important for us to talk a little bit about um, some of the, um, uh, talk about, you know, some of the things that are important to new gun owners, right, Mike? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a, again, you're new to this, right? At the very minimum, please clear your brain of all Hollywood stereotypes of how to hold a gun, how to run with a gun, how to do anything with a gun. And most importantly, right, select someone that's going to teach you correctly. Right. And I, and so to me, this one was the, I, I felt was, you know, we, the previous one, we talked about how to, you know, picking a gun and which one works for you and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and having a discussion about, you know, the types of actions and types of guns that are out there to try to maybe narrow it down for, for folks. But I think in this one, it's a, the important thing is, um, is to really understand the importance of uh, training and practicing. And there is a distinct difference between training and practicing, but, um, you know, for the sake of this, we need, we want to talk about how do you get that good training? And a lot of the things that, you know, I, I look at for me is that it, it, I don't know, it, it, it concerns me a little bit, um, about the two way community is it seems from my chair is that at times the the two A community can be not very inclusive, and you know so these new people are coming in and they don't know, they don't have you know they have questions and to if you're you've been around guns a lot is that these questions seem may seem you know pretty um, you know pretty elementary and you already know and so you know the people don't get treated in a way that makes them feel good about the rest of the folks that are out there and I think it's a, it's a, it's our responsibility is to make sure that these people that are new gun owners understand and that they feel you know welcome the one thing I will say is that I I think if any of us think that just because you know there's five million new gun owners that all of a sudden that's going to sway elections, you know, I, I think that that's that's naive to think that these are all of a sudden going to be um, voting the same way. And I, we might agree on one thing, but I imagine that we probably are going to be on different sides of, uh, of debates on other things. So I think it's important that we reach out and help these people to understand as they're coming into guns is understanding about uh, the lifestyle that it is when you are a gun owner. And I think it all starts with proper training. Yeah, I completely agree. A hundred percent. I mean, this is this, you know, we normally we say the foundation of, of holding a gun and, and really the foundation is where you're getting your training from, because that is the root of everything. Right. Uh, if you're if you have some guy that you think he's the best instructor since, you know, sliced bread and then all of a sudden turns out he shoots the ceiling just because he's carrying the. Uh, powerful 357 Magnum in a fully cocked position. I don't know if you remember that video, but that was pretty funny. Yep. Uh, but I mean, not to knock the NRA, but like any big company, it'll get away from you. I mean, those guys, they, they carry the, you know, the name, Oh, I'm an NRA instructor. Well, okay. That if you know anything, you should know that that really doesn't carry a lot of weight. Anyone can just pretty much go down and get an NRA certification. Right. And I think that there's more things to, you know, obviously people's credentials are important, but I think there are other things that a person needs to take into consideration. Um, and we wanted to point some of those things out, uh, because I think that if you've never handled a gun before you have, and you've never owned one, you definitely need to know how that gun works, how it functions, how to manipulate it, how to use it. Um, you know, we talked in the previous podcast about safety and, and how important it is that, that, uh, safety is part of any training and understanding those rules. So I think it's important to kind of break down in my, in the way I look at it is I think there's three main types of training that is out there for people to take. And you're going to have basic firearm familiar, familiarization. 
safety, um, and marksmanship. And that's where I think uh, a lot of the NRA stuff, they, you know, they, that's kind of their focus is on to that basic marksmanship and safety and that type of stuff. So when you take a basic pistol course, that's very, very a basic pistol course through the NRA. So I think that those are, you're going to find, uh, so let me tell you the, the three of them. So that it's going to be those basic type of firearms, familiarization, safety, and marksmanship. Then the next one is going to be defensive firearms courses. And then finally, the third type is going to be advanced defensive courses where you get more into tactical type of things. So kind of on the, on the surface, Mike, what is kind of, of those three, what's kind of, uh, how do you kind of break down what the, what a basic, um, entry type of firearms familiarization and safety course, what is it, what's that going to look like to you? Well, that's kind of like what we talked about in the last pa- uh, cast, right? You're gonna you're gonna want to know what kind of guns you need to be looking at, the safety of it, where to h- keep your guns, who to tell, you know, how to teach your kids how to stay away from guns, uh, how to at, at the very minimum how to keep it somewhat clean, right? You don't know how to completely tear it down to the last nut and bolt, but you do know how to run a squeegee through the barrel and stuff like that. Uh, what to do at the range, you know, don't point the gun at everybody around you. Uh, like we've seen in many, many videos. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that, I mean, that's like the scariest thing to me is that oh. you go, I mean, there are, there are, there's so many videos that are out there that a person can see is that to me is that that's, that's gotta be like one of the most important things that you do in any class. That's a basic foundational class is there's got to be a safety and range etiquette portion of that. And, and and really honestly is that I would think that that first class that's, that's range etiquette is like every step that you're out on the range, you're talking about that stuff. But I think that, I I don't know. I, I just, to me, the scariest place to go at times is actually the range. I mean, when you're, when you're, when you're trapped in there with those people. Yeah. I, I mean, I would, it's I I forget where I I must have been at Ben Avery out here in in Arizona, and the first thing I so I would always I carry with the guns that I'm going to shoot, and then I carry my concealed gun. And I think one time I was shooting prone for, on a long gun, and the guy came up behind me. He's like, "Hey, I, I can see your CCW." I'm like, "Okay," and like this is Arizona. It's open carry state. He's like, well, are you going to shoot that gun? I go, only if someone points a gun at me. <laughs> I'm like, this is the range. You I expect it. You know, like I, I always expect it. I, it's just, it's crazy to me that this, that we have to actually tell people when you're at the range, please don't point guns at other people. Right. But I mean, that's, you know, and, and you can, you'll see it in movies and I, in a the immediate one that I think of is um, Yes Man with Jim Carrey, and they're out there shooting a the shotgun, and and um, she goes up there and hits one of those clay uh, targets, and she's all excited, and she spins around, and do you see that I hit that? And everybody just hits the deck as she's swinging <laughs> around the shotgun. But it's it's that type of stuff that you know people just don't realize, and, and you know, and there's times when people are going down to change targets. If you go to some of these public ranges. You know, you can't be handling your gun when there are people downrange and, you know, there's, there's range safety people that are there. And, but still, I mean, there's a lot of etiquette that needs to be taught to people when they're out, out on the range. And I think that that's missed. And and that's a big portion, I think, of those basic firearms courses. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I think that not only what you're going to find when you take those basic classes is the expectation would be the majority of it is going to be classroom. Um, I don't think that you're going to be spending a tremendous amount of time out on the range. Uh, let's say if you took an eight hour course, I bet you in a basic class, you're going to spend maybe five or six hours are going to be in the classroom going over classroom type stuff because you've got to explain all of it. There's, there's obviously a performing of the things that were taught in the class, but I think the majority of it is going to be classroom you know, that, that should be the expectation is you're not going to be going out there and shooting. I mean, I bet most of them are going to tell you to bring 50 rounds, maybe a hundred rounds at the most. Yeah. And it's like, we've always told shooters and, you know, in the beginning of classes, you, you have to get accustomed to shooting that much ammo. You know, you're, you have to build up to those levels. I, me personally, 
if I'm practicing a skill set, I never shoot more than 50 rounds because you, if you're truly concentrating, that's going to be it. I mean, anything more than that, you're probably going to get mentally tired. You're not going to repeat the perfect practices, which we were uh, preaching, you know, so you got to, you really got to be dedicated and your instructor really should know what he or she is doing or it or whatever new pronoun is out there. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, I think that, you know, the other things that you're probably going to get in, in those, uh, basic courses, um, I think that you're probably going to have discussions, which, which, you know, we're going to be talking about here in the, the next episode is about ammunition, you know, caliber, um, the different kind of ammunition that's out there. Uh, you know, all those things are going to be important, but I think that one of the things, and we talked about it in the other, uh, the earlier podcast is about safety is, is, you know, the storage and how you store your gun. It should be a big portion of there. They should show you different types of, um, ways to store your gun safely. Um, so you can balance, you know, access to security, um, so I think those are all important things that you'll probably take in those classes. And then understanding, I mean, the, the big challenge with ammunition is understanding, um, you know, what happens when you have a malfunction. You know, I, I, it's scary to think is that you know, I, I know there's that video that was out there on the range where the guy had a misfire. I don't know if you saw this. It was an indoor range and the gun didn't fire and the guy took it and he looked straight down the barrel. Oh, oh. I would doubt it with the stuff that I've seen. Out and, there. and it's just like, it, it just shocks me to see the things that people do. And, and it clearly just because you can pick up a gun and it seems like it's pretty straightforward. Uh, yeah. It's just, it's just scary. And so, you know, if you're going to go and you're going to, why would you want to expose your kids to that type of stuff? If you're taking your kids with you or your spouse or something like that, you just, you should be able to, in my opinion, after taking one of these classes, you should be able to identify when there's an idiot out on the range that you need to, in yes. my opinion, is that if you're out there and you see somebody that's that much of an idiot, you just leave the building or you leave the range because yep. you can get hit from a mile away and you need to be far, far away. So you don't get, you know, you know we talked about the guy that got hit in a parking lot. I mean, it's, you're not far enough away when people are that, are that, uh, well, ignorant and, that's just and, and careless. Yeah, and that's just the physical aspect of it, right? So imagine you're taking your kids to the range and you have some idiot who loses his laser, decides to point the gun at his hand. Oh, the laser's still not there. I wonder if I press the trigger. Now he presses the trigger, he has no hand, and there's blood everywhere. Your kids, who you're trying to get into the sport of shooting, right, now all of a sudden see this spectacle. Do you think they're really going to have a good time at the range from now on? And let alone the thousands of dollars of, you know, psychological problems that they're going to have. I mean, yeah. No, that's a, that's a great, that's a great point. I didn't even think about that. I, I have seen that one where they've pointed it at their hand and it's just, it's just crazy. So the next one we get into is defensive firearms courses. And this is, and to me is, um, I, I think the important transition here is that from a basic fundamental uh, marksmanship and safety type of course is the transition to a defensive course is that when you go through the basic one, they're just talking about a target and it's just a bullseye and it's just a piece of paper and we're trying to get these shots. But when we go into a defensive thing, and this is what, this is what's important is that it is, you are transitioning into, you have made the choice to carry a gun because in a life or death situation, you are going to use that gun to stop a threat, which could potentially end another human being's life. And that is a huge, huge gap between a basic course and your first defensive, uh, you know, defensive carry type of uh, course. So the subject matter and the topics are going to um, be a little bit more mature, I guess. And you're going to have to start thinking about things and, and, you know, your targets are going to be people. They're not going to be just, you know, a silhouette or a bullseye. It's going to, you, it's, you're going to have to start thinking about having to pull the trigger and shooting at another human being. So it, to me, that's, that's the big change that I think people need to be real to realize is that the subject matter is mature. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're not shooting at a, a people target, then that's really not a defensive firearms course that you're attending because you really have to make that mental note snap, you know, from a bowling pin or X over to a human being that's pointing a gun at you. And and the target should should be that way. It should be a person pointing a gun at you so that your brain starts to recognize that. Right, because you have to know, you have to start thinking of things as a threat, a lethal threat to you and your loved ones, and the people around you. So that's it's just kind of the thing that has to be part of the training going forward. Um, you know, I think that uh, you know, obviously, this is going to be a more intense type of class environment. You're probably going to spend you're still going to spend some time in the classroom because you got to there's some concepts that you still need to go over that are going to be in the classroom, but it's safe to say that this this type of course, you're probably going to, at the minimum, spend 50% of your time out on the range, probably more like 75% of the time out on the range. So you have to be ready for that. The one thing that I would, when you're looking at taking these classes, is that I think that once we start getting into, if you took a basic uh, pistol class that was just marksmanship, familiarization, and safety, you could expect that you could be in a class with 20 or 30 people maybe more. And because you're just in a classroom, the ratios of instructors to students could be higher because it's more of a classroom setting. But when you get into a defensive shooting type of course, you've got to expect that the ratio, I mean, this is, this should just be you thinking this is if I go into a class where I'm going to start doing more advanced type of stuff. Um, and I have 30 students and one instructor you know, the spidey senses and alarms ought to be going off. The ratio should be very small down to like four or five at the most in students to one instructor, because there's only so much ground a guy can cover and watch as an instructor while the students are practicing. Yeah. And I mean, not only that so from the safety aspect of it, but also you want your instructor, you're paying, I would imagine you're, you should be paying, you know, much more money now for this class and therefore your instructor should be close to you to correct any problems that you may or may not have with the draw so if you're drawing incorrectly and you're not performing perfect practice you you would hope that the ratio is small enough that you might get away with it once or twice but an instructor should be good enough to go oh wait wait wait, wait. don't do that you know do it this way and you know hopefully provide the reason why not to do it that way and to do it his way because of a certain situation, whether it's the safeties are disengaging or you're, you're muzzling yourself as you come out of the holster or whatever. Right. Exactly. And and you're right. Is that more than likely you're going to pay more for those classes. You should be paying more for those classes. And, and the expectation is that you should get a little bit more one-on-one personalized attention to correct things because the, the whole hope is that the things that are taught to you and explained to you in those classes, the expectation would be is that you take that home and you continue to practice it and to become more proficient at it. So, so the question would be then, what should I expect to be doing in one of those classes? So Mike, if I, if, if we're going to uh, this next defensive pistol class or defensive class, what, what are some of the things that a, that a person would expect, a new shooter would expect to be seen and doing in that class? Uh, make sure you go in full kit with helmet, night vision, grenades, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> okay, no. If the class, if the class <laughs> requires you to be in full kit, you, you're that just walk away just go somewhere else yeah for you new shooters out there that's going to be stuff like uh when you see um any military movie where they have (laughs) kevlar vests uh plate carriers and helmets and you know microphone booms yeah it's got the armor yeah yeah (laughs) and they they got the the thigh rig and everything down where they're holding their their gun down on their thigh and stuff Uh, i will tell you full disclosure (laughs) You will go to classes more than likely if you decide to get a CCW, I'm willing to bet. I am, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say you have a 75% chance, three out of four, that you are going to go to a class for a CCW where some states you don't even have to shoot your gun. 
to qualify to get it. Some you do, but I'm going to guess 75%. You are going to go in there and there is going to be somebody dressed like that. <laughs> I, I challenge anybody to say I'm wrong, but <laughs> that's what's going to end up happening. The donut operators, right? That's right. Yeah. So at any rate, um, those are, you know, you're going to, if you're going to these classes, it's not what you're likely going to see. I mean, it's, they're, they're not going to be having you, you know, jumping over stuff and doing that. But a realistic expectation of what you should see is that you've gone from just marksmanship to now you have to start doing things like, you know, you got to get your gun out of your holster. You should not, they should be teaching you where to put your holster, what the proper position is, what's comfortable. Um, there's many different positions you can have it in, but most of the time they're going to work where it's going to be at your four o'clock. Um, so that's going to be on your, you know, if you're, well, if you're a right-handed person, it's going to be the four o'clock. If you're a lefty, it's going to be, let me see, what is that? Eight o'clock, right? Nine, eight. Yeah. I'm left-handed and I can't even tell you. It'll be at your eight o'clock or your four o'clock, right? So it's going to be a little bit back behind the side of your hip. They're going to position it in those places to where you can start, you know, you're going to start learning about how to get your gun and then the proper draw stroke of how to get that gun out of the holster and up on target. That's Guaranteed that's going to be in that class. Yeah, and this is where you'll find out where your Uncle Mike's holster is not good. And this is where you're going to find out that you need to buy five more holsters just to find the right one that you like, that wears correctly all day long, that you can draw from safely, and that you can reholster safely. Right, which is, you know, uh, what is going to be another one of our podcasts. The next one, I think, is getting into gear and and that type of stuff and selecting that because it's an important part of it. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, not only are you going to be learning the draw stroke, how to draw, shoot it, you're also going to learn how to, which is important, to reholster. Uh, and the one thing that I would say is, if you're going to one of those classes, is is make sure you understand early, and that you heard it here first, is that. Uh, there has never been a race to put your gun away first. It is not a race into the holster, but it is a race out of the holster. So take your time. That's where accidents happen is when people get rushing uh, to put their gun in their holster. So take your time. It's it's not a race to put it to put it back. Um, but that would be an expectation is that there's going to be one that's going to be in your class. Um, I think that additionally. Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but I bet you're going to spend some time learning how to load and unload <laughs> your gun. One would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have, I mean, either way, if you have a revolver or a semi-automatic, those are two distinctively different ways of loading and unloading. And so there has to be some time spent to explain that to you because you, you need to understand how to do that properly and how to do it safely, Right. Yeah, the differences between uh, administrative loads and administrative unloads, all, all kinds of stuff. Stuff that, again, this instructor should be clearly, and I mean clearly, stating prior to you even getting out on the range. You know, you, it'll kind of just be out there. And then when you get to the range, one would hope that the instructor would explain it, demonstrate it, show you what they want, and then you duplicate it, right? Right. And then, then you would have where, you know, believe it or not, guns, you know, at some point in time, you are going to have a malfunction with your gun. And it can either be something that you have created yourself, um, either through the way that you're um, handling the gun. It could be a malfunction that is based on the fact that how you maintained your gun, or it could be something as simple as you have bad ammunition. And so you have to be able to figure out how to uh, take care of those malfunctions when they happen, um, how to clear them, and then how to get your gun back in, as they're going to say, back into the fight to where you're able to then clear the malfunction and then fire again. So they'll be doing a lot of setting that up. You'll be working with dummy rounds, which dummy rounds are, um, they look exactly like a regular uh, round. Uh, they'll have a, you know, typically they'll have like a plastic bullet and then a regular case, and you know they call them snap caps also. Uh, but those are a lot. They don't fire. Nothing happens. There's no powder. There's no primer. There's no anything in it. They just are the same size as a regular round, and it will put those into your gun so you can have a failure to fire. You can have some sort of malfunction to correct. So you can expect that you're going to have to do that in one of those two. And it's funny because we talked about in the last cast about the type of weapon that you select. 
I, I remember a certain class that we were teaching out there and uh, this guy had a really nice 1911, like $1,500 or $2,000 gun. And the, the event evolved stress. It's really about stress, nothing less. But we had the students take apart their guns and put it on the ground. And when you told this guy that he had to put his $2,000 1911 in pieces on the ground, on the concrete, in the 110 degree Arizona weather, man, it, it was like he, we told him somebody stole his Ferrari and they put, you know, there was wheels off his Ferrari and put it up on blocks out in the parking lot. <laughs> And what, you know what I was waiting for that, what I was waiting for to happen on that one is when he ran up there, I was waiting for him to come up there and, you know, like slide to a stop and accidentally kick the slide, <laughs> you know, 10 yards down through the gravel. I was just waiting for that to happen. Cause I could just see that, you know, his head would have exploded at that point, but, for sure. but, um, the rest of it is you would probably, you know, when you start about talk about engaging targets is that you're now going to be looking at targets are now at varying distances. They're not just going to be a couple of feet away. They're not going to be five feet away, seven feet away, 10 feet away. They're going to be at different distances. We're going to start going to yards now. They're going to be three yards, seven yards, 10 yards. And those targets are going to be at different ranges. And obviously how you address those and how you, your site alignment and your site alignment should be the same, but the site picture, things change and how you adjust the way that you look at your sites in order to become accurate. Um, you have to, those things change at distance. And so, you know, the same target, uh, you're using the same size target at three yards looks a little different through these sites when you're at 10 yards. So you have to be able to, so you have to have a lot of that where you're going to be at different distances. Um, you are going to say something, Mike? Well, and as, as these instructors are throwing all these different curveballs at you, at the same time, this instructor should realize when he's he or she's gone over your head, right? So if all of a sudden you're doing something that could be dangerous or you're just not getting it, that instructor should be able to tell you, "Hey, let, let's let's back up, let's do this, or let's slow down." It should be it shouldn't be you know a PowerPoint bullet where the guy just goes through everything, the guy or girl goes through everything, and then just gets you know just to knock it out. Either they're just there to try and get their however many bucks, hundred fifty bucks for the day, and then be done with it. They, it really should feel like, hey, this is this is what I'm trying to show you, and I want you to try and do this. So don't get offended if they're going back over the things to try and give you that that mindset. Again, remember we're we're real good instructors are this is a hobby for us. We don't we don't do it. Trust me, there's no money in this. <laughs> so we're doing it because we want you to become a better shooter. Yep, exactly. And I and you know everybody is going to learn at a different and that's the reason it's important to have those ratios lower to where there's fewer students to the instructor is because everybody learns at a different rate. Um, and on top of that is not everybody is at the same skill level. So you're trying to get everybody. So everybody's going to require, um, you know, you might have to go over the same material a couple of times to a different student versus the other one. Uh, you know, your style should bring everybody to their level, um, of their, to that point of where they, things start to fall apart for them while still being able to do that for somebody who's at a different level next to them. So, you know, don't feel like just because a person next to you is shooting better than you or is getting the concepts down, you have no idea what they've done before. Maybe this is their third or fourth time through this particular class because people do that. Um, You just need to be focused on you and where you're at. And it takes fewer students to instruct her in order to give you that type of stuff to uh, that type of attention to be able to get you up um, to a, a good level. Uh, so I would also ex- expect if you went to one of these classes, you can expect to start moving. And I'm not saying you're running around like John Wick, <laughs> but what I am saying is that they might tell you to step to the right, take one step to the right, one step to the left, one step forward, one step back. Those type of things that you're going to be doing is because it's, it's you want to get those things as you it, you cannot just have your feet nailed to the floor there, you know, being a gunfighter, you're going to have to move around a little bit and, and, and that's what saves and protects you and keeps you alive is being able to move. So you have to be able to start thinking that way. 
So that you expect that you're going to get a little bit of that. You're not going to be, like I said, running and sliding and jumping over stuff, but you're going to start moving. So it adds just a new element to, um, to that training when you get into these defensive courses. And if you have the chance, and this is why the, the prices continue to creep up as you get to more of these types of courses, if you can get to a 270 range or a shoot house style range, number one, it's in it from an insurance standpoint, it's extremely high risk, right? If you can think about that, you're running through this house, walking through this house, trying to shoot targets with an instructor, you know, right on your heels to make sure that everything is safe. That's why these class uh, prices skyrocket unless, you know, you do it in the military or law enforcement. But talk about realistic. That is going to give you the most bang for your buck. Absolutely. Yep. I agree. Anything where it becomes, and when, when Mike's talking about a 270 is he's talking about the, the arc, that degree. So a 360 degree would be able to shoot in all directions. Not really possible because you're going to have people behind you, but 270 degrees is pretty much to your left, to your right and forward. And there's targets all around. Um, and, and so that really opens things up when there's targets all around you. So it, it definitely is an eye opening experience for sure. Um, I would, you know, the, the last thing that I would say about these, uh, these new shooters going into defensive course is we mentioned it earlier is a change in mindset is that there has to be, um, an understanding in somewhere in one of these courses is that somebody hopefully is starting to talk to you about, um, the effectiveness of your shooting on the target to stop the threat. And so there is going to be these minimum standard responses should be in some course. And whether it's two rounds center of mass or if it's three rounds center of mass, it might be two rounds center of mass, one to the face. Somewhere in that discussion and conversation and training is going to be those type of things that you're going to hear. And you can't have that if you're shooting at just a blank piece of paper or some bullseyes. So those are those things are those minimum standard responses that you need to start, you know, just drilling in is those two round center of mass, three round center of mass, two center of mass, one of the face. Those type of things just have to become part of the conversation in your training. And and to me is that the other one that probably comes up in these classes is the ABC drill. And so for me is that is really a failure to stop. And you have to be understanding when you're getting into these classes is that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to stop the threat. And if your minimum standard response is two round center of mass and they don't stop, what do you do next? And so those ABC drills are going to teach you what they should be teaching you. What are the next things you do in order to stop the threat? Because ultimately that's what we're trying to do. And unfortunately, that's the type of mature conversations and topics that are going to be in those defensive courses. Yeah, I man, I I really wish we had the momentum back in the day when we were doing this uh, almost full time when we made those targets up that fell. Remember those, man? I oh, yeah. I really I love those. I I wish we could have perfected that, and I wish that would have been the standard because talk about the full ABC. I mean, it was it was awesome. And so when we're talking about that is that we, you know, having reactive targets to where, um, you know, you make the right shots and the targets would fall. So you knew that you had shot until the, the, the threat had stopped and then you would move on to the next one. But, you know, you, you don't know in real life, you don't know until the threat stops. So you just have to continue to fire until they stop. And sorry. And you say, well, how does, how does somebody empty 15 rounds of their magazine? And, you know, that seems like overkill. Well, if the guys hopped up on, you know, methamphetamine, Coke and, and, uh, you know, anything else, it may take that. Sorry. That's the truth. It, it, it may take a full magazine and you might actually have to reload. So those are just, you know, the realities that people have to uh, be aware of. Well, and even going through those kinds of stressful events, you might miss a lot of people think, yeah. oh, I, I got hits. I got hits. No, you didn't. So it's important. Yeah. And then you'll learn just when you hear somebody say, oh, they should have just shot the knife out of their hand. <laughs> you'll learn how, or just shoot them in the kneecap. Yeah. Well, you'll, you'll soon learn how, how ignorant of a statement that is for sure. Um, next would be is once you've gone through those defensive 
that defensive course at first type of, um, uh, of course, you may take it one or two times before you feel comfortable moving on. The one thing that I wanted to make sure is when you hear, when you see those defensive courses, you didn't hear us talking about all this other crazy stuff. If you go to a class and they're doing a bunch of other stuff other than what we talked about, you, you're probably in the wrong class. So you just need to be aware of those. These are great questions to ask the instructor before you sign up for a class is ask them what type of things are we going to be doing? They should provide you with some sort of a description of the course so you can look and see what it is that you're going to be doing. And you've got to know that anything above what we just mentioned is beyond, if you're a new shooter, it's beyond your skill level and you should not be taking any class like that. So what we just mentioned is the stuff that you need to be focused on, get good at it practice, train, and take the class a couple of times. And then you can move on to these more advanced defensive courses where Mike will kind of talk about what we can, what a person could expect, a new shooter could expect in one of those type of classes. Yeah. For the advanced courses, I mean, it's going to be, again, it's going to be more intense. It's going to be more focused as to what it is that you're trying to get to. If you're trying to get to, uh, let's say it's home defense, right? So it's going to be more for that advanced defensive course. It it should be focused on barricades and stuff like that. Maybe that it's nighttime and there's lights are out. So you have to, your, your weapon should be now carry a weapon light on it and stuff like that. So it's much, much, you can get way into the weeds with this kind of stuff, especially at an advanced class. So stuff like that, you know, uh, preparing yourself as to what the event is going to be and what, might happen if you get hit. So now armor uh, comes into effect. Uh, again, you know, if the person is on crack or who knows what, you know, what they're going to, what, what to expect when that kind of an event unfolds. Right. And again, man, if you're, if you, if you see 25 people and one instructor yelling, that's, that's not a good sign. Right. Because, and, and all these high, high dollar classes and not to, not to bang on anybody, but like, a lot of the military guys, they always come and they're, oh, yeah, come to this class and we're going to shoot 1,500 rounds. I'm like, okay, that's fine if your round count is way high. But, man, it, there better be some extremely focused you know, uh, criteria that you're trying to meet with that kind of round count. I mean, in our academies, I think we were doing 2,000 rounds at the yep. most, yep. you know, and that was over uh, a week and a half to three weeks of class. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you, and you look at that and, and you think, okay, well, 1500 rounds and you got 20 students, that's 30,000 rounds flying down range. Um, y- yeah, you need to make sure that you got a solid lesson plan and some serious safety in place because that's a lot of lead flying for sure. So I, I just don't think that in these type of 500, if you were to say, well, how many rounds do you think I would take? I would say 250 to 500 rounds would probably be an advanced class for handgun. I mean, the reality is, is that you shoot any more than that is that, you know, I, I realize that the idea is to get repetitions in, but you know, there's diminishing returns and you know, you're, you, especially if you're a new shooter, your hands may not be used to firing and shooting that much and manipulating your gun and reloading and doing all that stuff. So these classes, I mean, they can get pretty intense. And so, you know, the, the reality of this next, this advanced class is that one of the things that we have always preached is, um, you know, that you have to think about is where you're going to get in these advanced classes is that it is preparing your mind for where your body is going to have to go. And that's, that's something that's, you know, think deep and takes a hard, hard look at that and think about what that means is that really is that you're, it, it's a mental thing. Um, to get you to be able to go through the stuff that you're going to have to go through in order to now perform all of this stuff. So you can expect that um, if you're um, if you're taking a personal protection inside the home type of course, uh, they're going to be focused on things that are going to be shooting around cover, uh, which is a you know a dresser, or a book stand, uh, a bookshelf, or, or around your bed, or a bathtub, or around corners. Um, open doors, that type of stuff. So you can imagine that you're going to be doing um, f- shooting from different positions. You're going to be kneeling. You might be prone. You might be standing. So you're going to be doing up, down, left, right, uh, moving back, forward, all those type of things. So you can expect that it's going to be a lot more of an active uh, class for you to do that. Um, 
you know, like Mike mentioned, is you're more than likely in your situation, a defensive shooting is probably going to happen uh, in low light. That's just the reality. So how do you do it if you have a gun mounted light? Do you carry concealed with a gun mounted light? Is it in your dresser with a gun mounted light? Or are you going to use a flashlight? Well, how do you use a flashlight with your gun and still be accurate? Because now you've gone from two hands to one hand holding a flashlight and one hand holding a gun. So these are the things that, you know, you have to uh, be expecting. And one of the big things that, too, and and Mike, you kind of touched on this, is has to do with um, those injury type of induced uh, things that you're going to have to do because you could be the person that got injured and shot and you're still going to have to be able to manipulate your gun, right? Yeah, I think uh, back in the day, I mean, we, a lot of people would ask, you know, well, why can't I uh, drop the slide with my thumb? Well, w- if you're aiming for center of mass, think about where those rounds that are incoming are also going to hit. If you've got your gun from the center of your chest and out, that's center of mass. So it is feasible that an incoming round can blast your thumb off. And if you've only trained to grab the slide, to slingshot it, to drop the slide with the, your thumb, as some people say, oh, there's no big deal. It's just as fast. Yes, it's just as fast, if not faster, until you don't have a thumb. Then it's going to be extremely slow. And in the middle of a gunfight is not a good time to learn a new skill set. You're probably going to have some difficulties. I'm just saying. Yeah, that's always been my favorite is that the last time you want to learn the very last uh, moment that you want to be learning a new skill is in the middle of a dynamic situation. That is for <laughs> sure. Where, you know, the shit has hit the proverbial fan. You don't want to be going, oh, well, hey, now I have my gun in my weak hand. Right. Um, how do I change the mag? Because there isn't a mag release on this side. Uh, right. Hold on. Time out. You, it doesn't work that way. You have to, that's the stuff that you have to start thinking about. And, uh, you know, and so it gets into, to the next thing is that they, you know, really in that you should be trying to increase that stress. And that's why shooting offhand and with one hand, uh, is because those, those are some of the realities that could be happening. If you're, if you have your child with you and you have your gun and you're trying to hold them behind you to, to provide them with some, some protection, more than likely you're holding them behind you with one hand and then you only have one hand to shoot with. So what do you do with that? And how do you, how do you, you know, work with only one hand? It doesn't necessarily mean you're injured, but those could be your realities. So I think another thing that you're going to see in there is a lot of judgmental stuff. Um, I really like the fact that they have uh, different shaped uh, like triangles, circles, stars, uh, and they're different colors and they have different numbers. And so you get up there and the instructor could throw out something to say, okay, uh, they could throw out three things, triangle, red, four, and you have to fire the rounds into whatever shape is a triangle, whichever one is yellow and whatever one has a number four. And that makes you have to think in a very short period of time and start using some judgment and thinking about how you do, how you do stuff. And it's just another way to add stress is they may tell you to, um, you know, a number 10. And so you have to shoot whatever shapes or colors add up to, you know, 10. So there's making this thinking going on while you're shooting. So you can expect those in those advanced type of classes. Yeah. Uh, I had a, we, we did a, uh, a training thing with a bunch of cops one time and we had two guys that were on SWAT and, uh, and I was there with them and I was, I was a bad guy. We were, we had the rubber bullets and it's funny because you can instantly tell who has been in what kind of scenario as soon as they start to talk about their real life experiences. So these two guys are talking about how they clear a house and they do everything and, and they're just talking to each other, you know, when they're cleaning the house. And the first thing I said is, it's funny, how are you guys, how are you guys communicating through all of this in a live shoot? And they go, oh, well, we have our radios and our satcoms and we, you know, they have the sound muffles, you know, the microphones clip so that the gunshot, their gunshots protected from their ears. They go, well, you, you've obviously never shot inside of a shoot house with your muffs off, have you? Because as soon as all that kind of nonsense happens, yes, your ears will clip once or twice and you'll get, they'll be protected. But after that, you're not going to hear a darn thing. So that's why you really got to be careful what people are telling you and the, you know, how much you can 
take in, especially with these advanced classes. Again, it depends on what the instructor was in before. If they were in the Navy SEALs, okay, great. Maybe they can shoot. Maybe they're buff and they can carry armor and ammo. But yeah, if they always had the best of the best equipment that the government can buy, is that what you have on your on your hip? Is that what you have you know, underneath your shirt as far as armor, if that's what you're carrying? So you have to really be careful with what you get yourself into. Is it fun? Is the class? Yeah, sure. Maybe the class is fun. But if you're truly there for defensive tactics that you're trying to learn, you you better make sure that you're in that right class and that you can bring it down to the level that you're putting yourself into when you're at the house or when you're at a restaurant or wherever it is that you know you're you're doing this for. Right. No, I think that's a great point. And, and, you know, I, I think that's one of the things when you're sitting there going, well, how do I, and we'll probably get into this here in a little bit, but you know, how do I determine, you know, what type of instructor or teacher of this class, you know, is the right one for what I'm trying to do. And I think that that plays an important role. What you're talking about is, you know, if it's a Navy SEAL and has all the best stuff and, and, you know, is that, is that you, so how, how can you, let's train in reality and relatable. I'm not saying that, you know, Navy SEALs don't know what they're talking about, but in, and, and they're highly skilled. Um, it's just that you have to think about how it applies to you and your realities in your day to day. And, and that's gotta be a, a, a consideration. You know, one of the things I, I looked at is I said, okay, and, and this has been for a long time, and, and I'll put my own twist on it, but uh, Kyle DeFore has a, a great way that he describes. He's a, he's a, uh, uh, a great in- instructor, and, and he, when he mentions about in, uh, instructors and teachers, is he said it was really as simple as only three categories. There's either the good ones, the, regurg- <laughs> the good ones, then there's the ones that regurgitate everything, that basically saw it here first and then told you about it, and eventually their skills will not match what they're telling you. And then there's the shitty ones. And those are the three instructors that are out there. And so you really have to be selective in trying to figure out who these people are um, and, and as, as far as instructors go. So we wanted to make sure is to take um, some of the question of what it is um, – you know, that is out there, some of the things that you should think about, what they should be doing when you're taking the class. And we threw out a couple of, you know, maybe even a couple of questions you could ask a guy or a gal that you're taking a class from them. So the first thing for me is, I think is most important is, um, you know, cause there was an instructor that, that I, that I have liked for a long time that, um, made a post on how a person should be shooting their handgun and, um, it was the way that they showed was wrong and the way that they do it is right. And I was extremely disappointed because not because my shooting style was similar to what he said was wrong, but my, my shooting style and position is a result of the fact that I have limited range of motion in my shoulders. Uh, so I have to adapt my shooting style to what I am physically capable of doing. And that doesn't make it wrong. That makes it 100% right for me. And so if your instructor is telling you or is is trying to explain that there is only their way of doing it, then you need to turn and run. That is not who you want to be taking classes from. That person should be leading you to discovery about what it is that you need to do to become a better, more proficient and more accurate shooter. They should be helping you understand why you do the things that you do and showing you based on your physical size, your physical strength, your maybe you ha- do have some sort of limiting thing that doesn't allow you to do something. Um, maybe it's because you're your cross-eyed dominant besides you know being right-eyed dominant. Any of those things can play a factor and they need to tailor that training so you, with who you are, are able to meet a certain level my opinion, number one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I remember the uh, young lady that we had uh, in a class and she had some kind of deformity in her right arm or something. So, you know, she could use that arm and it could get up to the gun and provide some kind of support, but she just couldn't do certain things. So again, if you're a good instructor, then you, you shouldn't even see that you, other than identifying the, you know, some limitations, but you should be able to go, oh yeah, no problem. Just do this, this, and this instead. So if that kind of if 
as an instructor, if that kind of stuff stumps you, then you probably need to go back and do some retraining of your own as an instructor. But if you, as the, as a student sees that, and just like Jay says, it's like, Oh no, this is the only way to do Then yeah, you again, get, get as far away as fast as you can from that guy. Yeah. Because right. Because I think that is, if they are not able to solve your issue that you're having, whether it be a physical limitation or something else is that that falls into the category of somebody who may be able to explain a concept and regurgitate what other people have been telling them or they've seen, but they can't figure it out. They don't, they, they haven't seen it or done it to be able to figure out how to make that stuff happen. And that's the difference. And so that's why you got to go, okay, well, you know, maybe this is not the person that I need to be taking classes from. Um, I think that one of the things that everybody needs to realize when they're taking classes is that you are never going to get enough repetitions in your class that you take to make any of this stuff stick. It is not going to, you're not going to, even if you took a class that had 1500 rounds, I guarantee you it's still not enough repetitions in order for it to be permanent. And so if your instructor is not teaching you the why of why you are doing something, it is going to be very hard for you to take that home and do the training and practicing that is required to make it permanent and practice perfectly. Yeah, the uh, the the best example of that I reminds me of that we, we did an academy and all we hadn't been so previous academies before the old instructors would just teach the shooting tests and the students would just shoot the tests to try and get by and become uh, deputies and 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 the, and the like and pass their qualifications and I'm like this is the dumbest thing in the entire world because you're not training gunfighters you're not training people to solve active problems you're just training them to shoot the tests I'm like that's that's idiotic. So when we started doing things, we no longer taught the test right off the bat. And we ran, we, we, I mean, we were in like week one and a half and students are like, Oh, when are we going to learn the test? I'm like, don't worry about the test. And then, you know, they got all pissy with me. I said, okay, I have an idea. If you guys can pass the test from the three yard line, I will give you guys all perfect scores for your tests. And they're like, really, really? I'm like, absolutely. But all of you guys have to pass. And they're like, okay. So we put them up on the three yard line, boys and girls, three yards from their target. And I went, okay, no pressure. Remember, you'll all fail. If if one person fails, everyone fails. Okay. Again, if you've done this as long as Jay and I have, you're going to know that just that pressure alone will be enough to pop somebody. And sure enough, you got four or five people that couldn't pass from the three yard line. And they were all pissed. And I go, now, what does that matter? You, I just taught you a small portion of the test. And because I put so much stress on you, you didn't pass. And that's it. That's from the three yard line. You don't even, and the funny part is this, they were, everyone was worried about long distance. You can't even complete the small distance and you want, you're worried about the long distance. I'm like, come on folks. It's again, we're, we're trying to show you the why. And then we're trying to make you better from that point. Yeah, and the reality was is that you could miss all of the rounds at 25 yards and still pass. Right. <laughs> so at any rate. Uh, With yeah. a pretty good score. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I think the other thing is is that if, if there – a lot of times you get these instructors that go out and they try to make things sound really cool, tactical, and fancy, and they make everything complicated and sound really intense, you know, I – I'm I'm all about Occam's razor, man. That's my thing. And that's uh, it, basically, if you're not familiar with Occam's razor, it's things should not be multiplied without necessity. And what that means is, is that adding more steps, more words, more everything into something just to make it cool is not, that does not get you anywhere faster. It at just opens up more things to go wrong. And so the teaching should be as simple as possible. I don't need fancy words to teach you how to shoot a gun. Okay. I just need to explain to you so you understand, so you can repeat it when I'm not there. And that's really what it it, it should be doing. That's all I ever kept repeating was front side, front side, front side. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) The the other one that really bothers me is that if you go to a class and your instructor never pulls out their gun. Yeah. Again, that's another question. They should be demonstrating accurately what they're asking you to do. And if they can't do it, then you got some questions there. I, I mean, we used to, when we would get to the range as the instructor's, 
we would warm up at the 100 yard line on steel. You should have seen students' faces. They're like, how are you guys doing that? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm the instructor. I should be able to do that, damn it. If not at 100, at 200 and 300. And we could for all the time, first shot. And if you can't do that, then as an instructor, then you need to go back to your roots and, and question what it is you're doing and, and why can't you do it, you know? You're supposed to be, and I, all the time I ask students to challenge me. Sure. Show me, show me what, what I can't do. I, I want to go to my breaking point. I want to go to my limit so that now I know what to practice next. Yep, exactly. Yeah. There's nothing better than, you know, than doing that stuff and, and demonstrating what you can do with good practice and good fundamentals. I mean, it, it doesn't matter. And we've mentioned that uh, uh, my favorite example is somebody calling us out was shooting on our back, like, <laughs> you know, and shooting steel in from that distance. And it's in first time and you just ring the steel and it's like the, the fundamentals don't change no matter where you are, but you should be able to demonstrate that stuff. And, and anybody that calls you out, you should have no problem going out and saying, yep, I can do it. Here you go. Let me show you. But that's, that's what you should be looking at. I don't know. My favorite time was a CIA lady. I thought that was great. <laughs> 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 okay, that too. All right. Um, the, the next one to me is, um, you know, we talked earlier in the other podcast about focused on safety. You know, safety isn't sexy, but it still needs to be talked about. And a lot of it, there needs to be a lot of conversation about that. Um, I think that if you go to an instructor or teacher's website, um, they should have uh, student reviews posted there for you to, re to read and to see those. None of that stuff should be hidden. Um, I also think that if you go, they should have their credentials published on their website so you can see who they are. And you say, well, what are some of the things that I can trust? Well, you know, the, Mike mentioned it about the NRA. I mean, the NRA is, is, a, uh, is a place to start. Um, you know, but if they have only one NRA course and it's basic pistol and then they're out there trying to teach you, you know, these advanced courses, that would be a red flag to saying, okay, here's a guy teaching or a gal teaching a basic pistol course. That's the only certification they have yet. They're teaching these advanced concepts. So those are the type of things that they need to make sense. They need to, you know, really add up to where it makes sense on the class. Uh, the, uh, USCCA is, uh, the concealed United States concealed carry association. Those are, they have certified instructors, uh, any of the police officer standards and training, uh, post certification in your state, if they have those type of certifications, um, and if they have any kind of state sort of state, uh, type of certifications, as far as instructors go, those at a minimum should be what somebody should have, um, to be able to, you know, have some sort of credential to back up what it is that they're trying to make you feel a little bit more comfortable at the, the training that you're going to be taking. Yeah. If you're uh, if you're a YouTube savvy and you like to dive down the rabbit hole, feel free to type in world's worst tactical training video. <laughs> I guarantee you you oh. will laugh out loud. So be careful if you're at work and you punch it in because yeah. that guy is just straight up easy bake oven, man. Yeah. That, I, some things that should just never have been posted. To the <laughs> no, no, I love it. I'm oh, so gosh. glad that he posted it oh, online. It's great. Yeah. yeah. And then the next one is the master instructor that fires that 44 mag into the ceiling at the range. That's even better. Yes. There's plenty of those out there. So, um, you know, one of the things I hate talking about cost, but cost is, is a factor is, um, if the classes are cheap and they're advertising for 29 bucks, uh, that's what you're going to get. Um, training is expensive. If you're going to go with a trainer who is taking, because in my opinion, if you're a trainer or teacher, you should be taking courses and classes from other trainers and teachers, uh, to keep up with the most current, um, theories, uh, testing your skills, learning new ways to, um, explain a concept, any of that type of stuff. So you should be able to, you should be taking those classes as an instructor and, Translation, um, if I'm taking a $1,500 course, um, I am not going to be putting on a $29 class. Sorry. That cost translates to how much the cost is for you. That's that's what you expect. Uh, so, you, you, you know, to me, is you should be scraping off the $29 
classes and you should be, that should be something that you should be looking at is, uh, you know, where is my budget and what can I afford? Do I need to take this training class and save up a little bit longer to take it? Or do I need to take more of these uh, classes that I can afford that are a little bit lower level, but become more proficient with at where I'm at? And I think that those are just some things to consider. Yeah. And, and again, you should be pushing yourself to your failure point, right? I'm like, I, I can't, I can't stress enough how, how many students would be like, oh, well, you know, how come, how come you don't do this? Or how come you never miss? Or how, again, it's not because I've been there, done that already, right? There's, there's no difference between me and a student. I, a hundred percent, we all have the same. We have a heart, we have lungs. The only difference is, is that my odometer behind a gun is just a little bit longer than the new shooter. That's all. I've just, I've been there and done that. That's all. Right. And I take my training when I, when I train, when I specifically pick something to, to train, that's what I 100% put 1000% of concentration on. And it, it should hurt after 30 minutes or 45 minutes of doing whatever it is that you're trying to focus on. You should be mentally exhausted. If you're not, then you're Superman or you didn't do it right. I, I, I kid you not. Yep. No, I agree. I think the, probably the last thing is, is that is the appearance and behavior of the uh, instructor or teacher is, I mean, it should be professional. And if, if they can't do that and, you know, the guy's looks like a slob, acts like a slob, well, you know, that's probably what you're going to get. And that's probably how the range is going to be maintained. And that's probably how the safety standards are going to be. Sorry, but um, if that hurts somebody's feelings, but um, that is just the way it is. You should use, you should, this is your money. Good training costs good money. And so, and it's your money and you should spend it with the people that you want to spend it with. And if you are a person who can't even, you know, uh, zip up your fly, tie your shoes, have pants that don't have holes in them, um, all those type of things, and at least look presentable and professional, then, you know, there you go. Just my opinion. Yeah, so, no, I agree. Uh, so I, we said we'd give you a couple of questions that you should ask. So I, I made a list of questions that I think would be good. So here would be another time for you to get a piece of paper and a pencil. Um, number one, most important question you should ask an instructor. Are they insured? If they aren't, that should be ra raise a red flag. Most ranges do not have insurance to cover your training. They are only covering for them. And if that trainer is training at a, is at a, another facility, the insurance of the facility is not going to cover you. The instructor is. So they need to be fully insured. So make sure that they have insurance and can provide it to you upon request. Um, next one goes back to what I was talking about just a minute ago. Ask them this. When was the last time they took a class themselves and who was it with? That'd be a good question to ask. Um, like I said, keeping up skills is not cheap and that's going to be going to the cost of your class. So you want to make sure that you're um, looking at that and asking that question. Um, here's another good one. How many classes have they taught? Now, most people would say, well, it would be more important to say how many years have they been an instructor? I've been an instructor for 20 years. Okay, well, if you're only doing one class a year, two classes a year at the most. That, and at CCW. <laughs> yeah. yeah you, you, 20 years doesn't mean anything. So how many classes have they taught? And that's really more important because that's going to tell you, are they doing it every other weekend? To me, is if they're doing it twice a month, they're doing a class twice a month, that's 24 classes a year. And if you take that and you say the guy's been doing it for five years, 24, that's what, 120 classes? I'm thinking that guy probably has had some time and has seen quite a bit in 120 classes over the last five years compared to a guy that's been doing it for 20 and has only done two a year. So I think it's more important to know how many classes they've taught. Um, next one is, what is their teaching experience? And that would be a good question is not necessarily what is their experience is just an instructor, but what is it as far as teaching people complex concepts? Uh, both Mike and I had to go through a general instructor's uh, course, and that was 
you know, we had to go through learning how to do, you know, presentations, learning about different types of learners, um, different ages of learners, and being able to go through and do pre multiple presentations over the course of, you know, what was that, 80 hours? Is that how long that was? I don't know. It was a long time. It was a long time. <laughs> there was a lot of evenings. And, but you, that is to be a better teacher. We weren't, we weren't firearms instructors. We were learning how to teach concepts. And what do you do in your, if it's not a full-time job, what do you do in your regular, regular job? Um, you know, are you, are you a person who has to do presentations a lot with people? Are you in a job that requires you, you know, maybe you're in sales where you have to present features and benefits and you're in front of people and maybe you are a, an actual teacher. Those, or you have, and you have to guide and teach, uh, your employees. Those things are impor important to know, um, what they do. So that helps you gain gauge, whether they're a good and a good teacher. Um, then of course, how long have they been an instructor? It's, imp it's important. Um, still do they teach other classes? Um, or are they just a one trick pony? Uh, is there full time, is this their full time job? And if it's not, what is it? Is it in the same industry? Is it similar? Does it have transferable skills that would help? It's a good question to know. And then what firearms or teaching certificates do they have, which goes back to credentials? Did it, do you think I missed anything there, Mike? No, that sounds about right. I'm trying to think about anything else. No, I mean, it's pretty decent. Well, here is a, there was a couple of things that I, I wanted to before we let everybody go is has to do with um, the type of practice and training that you can do. And there's two things, two ways that you can train and practice. And one is dry fire and the other one is uh, live fire. One, one costs a lot of costs money because you have to pay for ammo and the other one doesn't. And you can do it as much as you want for free. And so dry fire is just that is there's no ammunition, um, you're practicing the same drills and the same things out on the range as you that you would with ammunition. You're practicing those things without ammunition, dry fire with your firearm. So it doesn't cost you anything. It's real easy. However, I will say this is that it has to, you still have to take safety serious, even on those, uh, even in dry fire, making sure that that gun is unloaded and you don't have any ammo wherever you're doing it. So it allows you to practice those manipulation skills. Um, you're able to do those repetitions that we were talking about in, in the classes. You can now do those repetitions to make those things permanent. Um, if you have a training issue, you can slowly walk through them and try to perfect them and work out the problems. Um, learn new movements. So if somebody teaches you how, if somebody is trying to teach you how to do something that you've not done before, and it's the first time you saw it, when you get back after that class, you can do a dry fire. You can practice those things because it's something new that you just learned. Uh, the only other thing that I could recommend is that if you don't have a timer, um, I think a timer is a great tool to add a little bit of stress. And it also tells when you've made improvement. I did come up with one from before. Make sure that your instructor can self-evaluate, like they can evaluate the student. So what I mean by that is that, okay, you're done with the class and then you should be asking your instructor, hey, wh what did you see that I fell short on and what what do I need to improve, i.e. what kind of homework do I need to do? Right. Yeah, no, I think that's that's good for sure. Is to be able to give you after after a class is to give you kind of a critique and tell you, hey, take this home and practice this for sure. Um, live fire drills, when you go and take a class as you're out at the range and you're practicing, obviously those things are are important um, when you're firing uh, your, with live ammo. Um, I think a lot of that has to help you develop um, that firing cycle, which is when you, you know, put your gun on sight, you have to orient towards the target. Uh, you have to have sight alignment. Then you have to manage your trigger as you're pressing the trigger. And then once you fire the gun, you have to manage the recoil and bring your sights back onto the target and then be able to fire again. That's like, and then repeat that. And you can't really get that with dry fire. Um, so there is time where you're going to have to get used to that and how you're going to recover from recoil and that type of stuff. So that's an important part of those live fire, live fire drills. Um, you know, if, if you're going out to the range and you're doing drills is that to me is that you have to have a specific reason for going out there. So if you're wanting to be faster, if you're trying to be more accurate, get more rounds in a shorter period of time, those are the type of things that you'd want to be doing when you go out to the range. What other stuff do you think, Mike, as far as those live fire stuff when you go out there? 
Uh, you know, again, it's more specific to you. Like you, once you start taking these advanced classes, you start, uh, eventually you want to get to a self-diagnostic, uh, self-diagnostic thing. So you would automatically know. Like every time I press the trigger and I let one go, I immediately know whether I'm like, ah, oh, I, I flinched. Ah, oh, I pushed to the right. Ah, oh, I pushed to the left. I healed the gun, you know, stuff like that. So eventually you'll get there, right? It, I remember a student one time, He's we shot the same model, uh, so he handed me a forty five mag, and he goes, how many rounds are in here, uh, Garza? I need to make sure I can go to the next one. And I threw it back to him, and I said, 10. And he looked down at the sight holes in the back of the mag, and he goes, how do you do that? I'm like, well, dude, if, if I do this all day long for all year long, I better know. Like you, Those kinds of things will just start to come and that's why the live fire is just as important as the dry fire, because that's the kind of stuff when you when you bring your gun up and you look down your sights, you you shouldn't you shouldn't have to wonder what comes next. You should just do it. What you need to be waiting for is that click when it doesn't go bang. And then you better be able to, you know, boom, all of a sudden pop out uh, tap rack. Right. Or if your your gun, your slide locks to the rear and your gun, your mag still feels heavy, you should automatically know, hey, oh, I've got a I've got a bigger problem now. So it's almost like you're you're looking for the problem. You know, you, once you've shot so much and you see that sight picture that you want to to release that round, it that should come that should be the norm for you once you really get up there in round counts and you should be waiting for the stuff that you don't want to see. You know, you don't want your gun running dry. You don't want, you know, your gun half slides locked, stuff like that. Yeah. And I think that the other thing too, is that when you're doing the live fire stuff is that it, you have to, when you're going out there shooting, it's kind of got to be built around, um, to me is the specific situation that you're in. So for example, is if you're in the colder climates, where you're going to be wearing, you're going to be carrying concealed and you're going to have it under your jacket and you're wearing a big parka and maybe you got gloves on. Well, have you practice with your gloves on? And have you practice with that giant jacket on? Because sometimes, you know, things can change. Um, and if you're in a warmer climate, like we are in Arizona or, or Nevada, um, you know, you're not wearing big bulky clothes. So you're going to be wearing stuff that's has to be more concealed. And so, um, you know, I, I always give a, people a hard time that wear flip flops all the time because not because I don't like flip flops and I hate flip flops, but you know, have you gone out to the range and tried to practice uh, shooting in flip flops? Um, you know, it's a, it's not stable footing. Um, you know, you get a rock in your shoe and now you got it. Now you're trying to fire a gun. I mean, it, it's you just have to those situations, environmental situations. Uh, for temperature, rainy weather, wind, whatever, your gear, your clothing, all that kind of stuff is you need to work through it and test it out on the range live fire, my opinion. I don't understand. I mean, if Instructor Zero can put a gun in his sock, then I should be able to wear (laughs) flip-flops. We didn't put a gun in his sock, like down by his foot. He just took his sock off, stuffed it in his pants, and then wrapped his gun in it. That's how it worked. (laughs) Anyways. So, so, Hey, before we uh, let everybody, let everybody out of here, recommended drills, what kind of, what kind of drills are, are, would be on your list, Mike? Good. Throw a couple. Yeah. I mean, again, it depends on where you're at and what you're trying to do. Uh, the, uh, postcards, you know, or the, uh, three by five card shooting at that, you know, slow, steady, uh, good stuff. Uh, again, it just depends on what it is you're trying to do. If you're just literally trying to memorize your trigger, then it would just be slow fire practice on your trigger, not worrying about your aiming and going, you know, back to the reset and then breaking that crisp, clean shot. So again, it just really depends on what your goal is. If you're looking at speed, you know, try the two, two, two drill, you know, different things like that. If you're, if you're trying to focus on just a little bit of everything, the dot torture is always good stuff like that. So it, again, it just depends on really what it is that you're trying to go for. Yeah, no, I think that that's my only other recommendation on top of whatever training you're doing is make sure you're using a uh, human type target. So it's got to you know, just get used to that. Put that in your mind. Get those type of uh, uh, pictured targets. Uh, somebody pointing a gun at you or whatever. 
Um, but yeah, I'm, a lot of those things that you meant that you mentioned, um, anything that gets you, makes you have to think, I, I really like the dot torture cause it mixes up a bunch of different things. Now, one of the concepts is if you aim small, you're going to miss small and that dot torture forces you to have to aim small because the little circles are pretty tiny, but you have to do a lot of stuff. Um, I, I also like the two by two drill, which is basically two rounds, 20 seconds to 20 feet on a three by five card. That was like an old army special forces type of drill. Um, I think, uh, I think Dave Spalding does that too. I think that's one of his, his drills that he does as well. And then for me, I will always love, even though it's just a test is the Arizona post qualification. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. I just like it. So it's not it's really a, a drill, test. but it's a good test to see where your skills are at different ranges. And that's yeah. just, just my thing. You can look it up pretty much anywhere and get that. So, yeah. yeah and if you have a hard time trying to, like when we say concentration is really, uh, I, when I played baseball in high school, I wasn't any good because I'm Mexican. I should have been playing soccer. But when the, our coach used to tell us when that pitcher throws the ball, don't look at the ball, look for the red laces on the ball and yep. i'm like that blew my mind because i'm like oh yeah wow and then and then try and do that right the the level of concentration that that really focuses you to do is really what you should be going to so when you do your dot torture don't look at the circle look at the number two that's in the little circle and then pick the flat part of the little two on the very very top of that right so it is very 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 specific Yep. No, I agree. That's, that's great. Is it, it, again, it takes your, takes your focus to a much smaller level. And so you're, that's just where, how you do it. And, and guaranteed every time we tell people to aim small and you miss small is that they're shocked to see how that type of concentration really makes a big difference. Um, so last thing, Mike, is that I was thinking of, you know, sometimes people don't have the luxury of having somebody like you or I close by, um, and they don't know how to evaluate what people are saying and what they're doing. So I kind of took the time to put together a couple different, four different types of instructors that are out there that are fairly accessible to their information on the internet and YouTube. Um, you know, they're there. And so you can go and look at the stuff that they're putting out there and you can see what, in my opinion, I think these are very good instructors. And I think that they, the stuff that they put out will give you an idea of what somebody else, if they're talking about something that's way different than what these guys are talking about, you might question. So my first one is, is if you are an old school person, and you like no nonsense, no bullshit, tell you the way it is, then these two guys are two of my favorite. And the first one is Clint Smith over at Thunder Ranch. And that guy is just old cop and he just, he's just grisly, man. And he just says it the way it is. And if you don't like it too bad, the other one is Dave Spaulding. I've been following him since I remember reading the uh, police one magazines and law enforcement magazines on the break room, uh, at, at the, in the district, um, Dave Spaulding with handgun combatives. He's a great one. Um, I th- he might be retiring. Maybe he's finally uh, done. I don't, I'm not really sure, but yeah, I, I think the last time it was last year we were, but right before COVID, I think he said he was going to, but I don't, I don't know. It's been a year now. So maybe yeah. he's back at it. Yeah. But he's still got his, but he's still got his videos out on, right, out on right. YouTube and stuff. The other one, if you really want a thinking man's instructor, somebody who really, really takes it down to the granular stuff and really is, uh, very, um, uh, intellectual about it is, uh, Aaron Cowan with Sage Dynamics. That guy's guy's awesome. I really like his stuff. He really breaks it down. Um, he's written a couple of white papers on the uh, reflex, uh, sites, uh, the RMRs on, on handguns. Um, the other one is Kyle lamb, um, with Viking tactics, another good guy, uh, and, and Matt Graham with Graham combat, who I think is also now retired, but their stuff is still up on, uh, up on YouTube and stuff. Uh, if you're looking at more of the competition stuff, um, Mike Seeklander with shooting performance is a good guy. Uh, he's got, he's really a good instructor, a uh, very, very good shooter. Um, the other one, unfortunately, uh, he passed away is Ron Avery with tactical performance center there in Southern Utah. Um, but he has a really good book that came out last year. 
um, that uh, I think you can get on on Amazon. I, I'll have to put the link up. I can't remember what it's called, but it's a it's a really a really good book, and and uh, his videos uh, are are good as well. And then if you're into the military thing, I had to put I had to you know I I like Chris Costa. I, I know people you know make fun of Chris and all of his stuff, and but I like that, Chris Costa. That would be a bad mistake to make. Fun of Chris. Yeah. <laughs> but, he's pretty darn good. But but uh I, I just I really like I think he's a funny guy and I think he's a super intense guy, but he also knows what he's talking about and he also breaks his stuff down to where it's very easy to understand. Yeah. So are you talking about gun lap from him? No, that's not it. No, you know, he was the the one where he did that remember that thing he did in Japan with all the airsoft guys and he was doing his Right, right. No, no, no. I was talking about uh uh what's his name? that just passed i don't know the book the book oh ron, ron avery ron avery yeah oh yeah yeah i'm trying to remember what the name of that uh what the name of that book is maybe you can find it for me before we get done i'll put it in the notes but uh chris costa the uh, company he is is costa ludus uh you can find it there and the other one is frank proctor and uh he's from alabama i think and all special forces guy and and he's he explains things really really well he is very much a simple is better type of guy everything is very slick uh his company's called frank proctor shooting so uh if you any of those things are of interest, check any one of them out and, um, um, and you know, you get an idea of what good instructors are and the, the information that they share with their students in, in the way that they teach. Um, and they're not just instructing, they're teaching people to, to be better at what they do. So, um, other than that, Mike, that is about no. all I've got. What do you, what do you have? Anything no, else? I think that's good. Uh, the only one that I found from Ron was uh, Practical Shooting, Essays on Shooting Tactics Training from a Grandmaster. So that was written in 2019. So Yeah, that's probably it. You can even get that on Amazon. So I know Yeah, they, that's, that's where I'm on right now. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you can do, just go to Tactical Performance Center. They have a link straight to it. So that's, uh, yeah, it's a good good book. A lot of information in there for sure. So, uh, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I got. So I uh, appreciate everybody hanging in there. This was another long one. We felt it was, this stuff was good, important things to share with everybody. I hope you liked it. If you have any questions on anything uh, or comments, um, please be feel free to shoot us an email, podcast at latentforce.com. Uh, or you can put it in the, sh- in the uh, comments of this podcast or you can put it in the comments of any of our Facebook posts with the uh, podcast on it. We'll be sure to answer your questions or reply to your comments or maybe we'll embarrass you and bring it up on the next show. And we will catch you guys on the next one. And that'll be a wrap for this episode of the Latent Force Prepared Defensive Action Podcast. Be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube, or visit our website, www.latentforce.com, so you can get all the latest info from Latent Force. If you have any comments or questions on this episode, or if you have a suggestion for a future show, you can reach us by shooting an email to podcasts at latentforce.com. On behalf of Mike Garza and myself, thank you for joining us. Be safe, and as always, stay in the fight. Peace out.